Him. What a sweet time of worship this morning. And now that I know y'all can clap, it opens up a whole new realm of possibilities. Normally when we come to Scripture, this, uh, we have a Scripture reading that prepares us, but instead of that this morning, would you just join me in a spirit of prayer, and as you just close your eyes and just draw the curtain around you, and it's just you and the Lord, would you have the courage to ask this question? God, is there something you want to say to me right now? God, is there something you want to say to me right now? Father, part of the beauty of the gospel is the sovereign God over all creation knows each one of us individually. And you love us, and you have written down the days of our lives in your book, and you have a good work for us to do, and you love us enough that you would speak. Lord, is there something that you would say to us today? And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. If you've got your copy of the Word of God, I hope you'll find Isaiah chapter 6. We come this morning to probably one of the best known passages in all of the book of Isaiah. Isaiah's call experience. This is when God... At least this is what we assume, that God is calling Isaiah and commissioning him to be a prophet. But I think that we're going to see something this morning, that there's more going on here than just simply God saying to Isaiah, hey, this is what I want you to do with your life. I want you to be a prophet. And we're going to see that it has much more to do than just the life of Isaiah, but it really has to do with what do you do when you hear the word of the Lord. So let's look at this and read together. Isaiah chapter 6, we'll read the first part. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, and the whole earth is filled or full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost." I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongues from the altar. And he touched my mouth, and he said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. Now, it's pretty odd. We have been in the book of Isaiah for a month now. I know some of you are thinking it seems longer than that, but uh, it's only been a month. And we've gone through five chapters of Isaiah preaching, and we finally get to the call story. If you think about it, most of the call stories in Scripture take place at the beginning of the ministry. When God calls Moses in Exodus chapter 3 at the burning bush, although we know about his life as a child, that was the beginning of his ministry. That was his call. Think about Samuel in the tabernacle as a young boy, and God calls Samuel. That was at the beginning of his time of service. book of Jeremiah begins in chapter 1 with his calling. God comes to Jeremiah, I appointed you to be a prophet in your mother's womb. Uh, Even in Ezekiel, who has this incredible visions for his call, the first two chapters are this elaborate vision, but part of that vision is the call. This is the message I've given to you. But for Isaiah... It does not happen at the beginning of the book, and it does not happen at the beginning of his ministry. 
You notice there's a date stamp to this vision in the year of King Uzziah's death. Now, if you go back to chapter 1, verse 1, it tells us that Isaiah began to minister in the days of Uzziah. So he begins to minister while Uzziah is still alive, and in the year of his death is when he has this vision. This is not so much an initial call experience as it is a vision that God gives to Isaiah after he had been preaching for a bit, and it gives it to encourage him, to redirect him, and to focus his ministry. So think about his message so far. Chapter 1, he comes out of the, out of the gate. You are a sinful nation laden with iniquity. Then he changes a little bit and issues the invitation. Come, let us reason together. Though your sins are as scarlet, they could be white as snow. Then he gives them a vision of the latter days. Walk in the hope of the light of the latter days. And then he's very upfront with them and says, God has a day where he's going to tear down everything that is proud and lift it up. And then he puts all of that in a story form, the parable of the vineyard. What he's been saying so far has been tough for him to preach. It's been tough for the people to hear. And now he's in a moment of national crisis in the year of King Uzziah's death. Now, there are certain kings in the Old Testament that we know better than others. If I say David, I say Solomon, immediately you bring up all these stories. We don't know much about Uzziah, anything about his life. Let me tell you a little bit about Uzziah. Uzziah was one of the very few good kings in the southern kingdom. There weren't many. He was one of them. He was king for 52 years, 52 great years. The nation was very prosperous. It was very peaceful. In fact, the nation was about as strong and prosperous as it had ever been since the days of Solomon. Everything was going great. And at the end of Uzziah's life, he falls into pride. And Uzziah, who is king, is not content just to be king. He also wants to be priest. Doesn't like the fact that he gets to be king and do all this stuff, but he can't go inside the temple. That's just for the priests. And so he decides, I don't just want to be king. I want to be priest. So he shows up at the temple and he marches in and he wants to light the incense at the altar of the incense. But the high priest tries to stop him. Eighty priests try to get in his way, try to stop him. But he is the king, and he forces his way in, and he lights the incense at the altar of incense, and he's holding up that censer, and there's smoke coming off of the incense, and God strikes him with leprosy right there in the middle of the temple. He's driven out of the temple. He can't go back to the palace. Once you have leprosy, you have to live in isolation from the rest of humanity. He's off in a little hut for the rest of his life, and his young pup son becomes king. And the nation is freaking out. We had a good thing going. Everything was great. We were prosperous. It was peaceful. We had a great, good king. Now we got this Jotham. We don't know what we're going to get with this and what's going to happen. And in the midst of that crisis, God gives Isaiah this vision. Now, the people of Jerusalem and Judea are not that much different than you and I. We put a lot of our hopes in the health and prosperity of the nation. We put a lot of our hopes in who's leading that nation. And when there's a change or when there's a weakness or where there's instability, we start looking for where's where's our hope. And in the midst of that, God gives Isaiah this vision. Compare the vision of Isaiah to the experience of Uzziah, right? Uzziah is a king, marches into the temple because he wants to light incense, and he lights the incense, and the smoke begins to go up, and God strikes him with leprosy. But what is Isaiah's vision? I remind you in the temple, when you walk in the temple, the first two-thirds of that is the holy place, and then there is the curtain, and behind the curtain is the most holy place, right? And that's where the Ark of the Covenant is, and on the Ark of the Covenant, there are these two golden cherubim right there, and in between that is the mercy seat, and that's where the presence of God sits behind the curtain, and on this side of the curtain, there's the altar of incense and the table of showbread and the candles, right? And so Isaiah's vision, as he looks into the temple, what does he see? He sees 
The Lord sitting, but not on the ark, not between two little golden cherubim, but he sees the Lord sitting on a throne, and he sees the Lord high and lifted up, and he's not surrounded by two little golden statuettes that look real cute. He is surrounded by the seraphim. We don't even know what the seraphim are. It's the only place in Scripture this word is used. The word literally means burning ones, some kind of angelic divine figure. And he sees the Lord high and lifted up, and it says the train of his robe filled the temple, or the hem of his robe. The little stitching at the bottom of the robe was so great that the stitching filled the tabernacle, because the whole earth is full of his glory. Uzziah, when he marched in, he marched in with his kingly robe, and his little stitching didn't fill up much space at all. But when Isaiah sees the Lord, the stitching of his robe fills up the temple. And you see the two seraphim, these fiery angels, and they're calling out to each other, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Remember, host is not an angel choir. Host is an angel army. He is the Lord Yahweh, the king of the angel army. This is why Isaiah's favorite name for God is the Holy One of Israel. This moment left its mark. It's the holy, holy, holy. The foundations of the threshold shook. Literally, it's the foundations, it's the doorpost. Isaiah, even in his vision, didn't make it very far into the temple. He made it just to the doorpost. Isaiah struts on in, all the way up to the altar of incense. Isaiah barely makes it, and everything is shaking when the voice of the Lord speaks. And Isaiah has this realization. Notice that the house is filled with smoke. It's not filled with smoke from the little censer that Uzziah had when he lit the little incense thing. It is filled with the smoke that's coming off the fiery one, the seraphim, the whole place. Do you see how Uzziah's experience is trumped by Isaiah's experience? And he says, woe is me for I am lost. That's the ESV. It's, I don't, it's not a very good translation. I'm ruined. I'm destroyed. I am undone. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. Now, why does he talk about his lips? Remember, Jesus says, out of the mouth, the heart speaks. So the lips is just the evidence, the testimony of what you have in your heart. He says, I am an unclean man. Remember, what does Uzziah, now that he's struck with leprosy, as he lives off in isolation, what does he have to say every time another human comes close? He has to cry out, unclean, unclean, unclean. And yet Isaiah, in his vision, does what Uzziah did not know when he was in the temple, is he confesses that he is unclean. My eyes have seen, and notice the word, king. What was the cultural crisis? Who is going to lead us? Uzziah is, is now in isolation. Who's going to be our strong king? Who's going to lead us into peace and into prosperity? Who's going to be our king? And God calls Isaiah with the vision, I am the king. I am the king of hosts. Focus on me. Woe is me. And then one of the seraphim, one of the fiery ones, flew to me, and he has in his hand a burning coal from the altar, and he touches his lips, and he says, your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. And that word atonement is such a huge biblical word. It means to be at one. It means to be reconciled. In the New Testament, when you see the word reconciliation, it's that same concept as you see atonement in the Old Testament. We are reconciled. We're first introduced in the book of Leviticus where God gives the law to Moses and says, when you have sinned, you can bring a burnt offering to the Lord, and God will accept that burnt offering as atonement for your sin. You will be at one with God. You will be at peace with God through this offering. But notice here, there is no burnt offering on the altar. The seraphim doesn't offer a burnt offering for Isaiah. Isaiah doesn't bring a burnt offering. It is a coal from the offering, from the altar itself, foreshadowing the once and for all sacrifice for our sins. Christ, who is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. We see the gospel foreshadowed here in Isaiah. When we see the living God and we confess that we are a sinner. And there is nothing we can do about it. We can't bring a burnt offering. We can't do anything. We are simply lost. And God has to do something 
for us. God doesn't send the seraphim, but He sends His own Son, Jesus Christ, to become the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And if we receive that gift by grace through faith, our sins are atoned for. It's a beautiful picture of the gospel. And it would be nice if the vision ended there. We could bring the band up and we could sing and we could go home. But that's not where it stops, is it? Verse 8, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And whether this is the Trinity at play or whether this is God, the Lord, speaking to the seraphim, who's going to go for us and send out my word? And then Isaiah simply says, Here I am, send me. That's a, that's a great little t-shirt. But I think there's probably more to what Isaiah is saying than just those words. I think what Isaiah says to the Lord is, I've been trying. You've given me visions, and I've gone out, and I've preached, but no one's listening. And I've tried everything. I did the direct approach. I just went out there and said, you're a sinful people laden with iniquity. No one listened. Then I tried the redemptive approach. Come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they can be white as snow. And then I tried to give them a hopeful approach. You know, let's talk about heaven and, and see if they'll get excited about that and change the way that they live. And then I gave them the, you know, the, the hard sell. God has a day when he will tear down everything that is proud and lift it up. Then I even went to a story. You know, the, the visual people, I told them a story of a vineyard. Still didn't get it. God, I've been going. No one is listening. They are putting their hope in some king and who the king is going to be. And that's why God says to him, go, say to this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. Verse 10 it's one of the most challenging verses in all of the book of Isaiah. And people of God have been struggling with this really for 2,700 years because it sounds like what God is saying is, I don't want them to turn and be healed. That's what it sounds like, doesn't it? You, I'm giving you a message. I want you to go out, and I want you to make their hearts, their ears, and their eyes. I want you to make it all dull because I don't want them to understand and turn and to be healed. Well, is that what the prophet is really saying? Is that what God is really saying? One of the best interpreters of Scripture, I think you would agree with me, one of the best ways to interpret Old Testament Scripture is through Jesus. Do you think Jesus would be kind of the best interpreter of what Old Testament Scripture is? Two times Jesus in His ministry quotes this passage from Isaiah. We don't tend to do that. We tend to have these uncomfortable passages of Scripture that we don't understand, and we just kind of avoid them. We just kind of stick them in the pocket. We won't bring them up. But twice, Jesus quotes, and he puts it in context, and he applies it, and he helps us to understand what did it mean then and what does it mean now. So the first one is in Matthew 13. Matthew 13, Jesus tells the parable of the sower. You know the parable of the sower? Sower goes out to sow, and he throws some seed. Some of it falls upon the path. Some of it falls upon the rock with the shallow soil. Some of it falls among the thorns. Some of it falls among the good soil, and it grows and bears fruit. And then Jesus explains it. Afterwards, he says that seed is the Word of God, the seed that falls upon the path. That's the, the people they hear, but they don't understand the Word, and Satan snatches it from them, so then they don't believe. The shallow soil, the rocky soil, those are the ones who hear, and initially they respond well, but then they realize that there is some suffering and tribulation on, tribulation on account of the Word, and so they fall away. The thorny soil, those are the people who hear, and they respond well, and they begin to grow, but then it gets choked out by the desires for riches, the cares of this world, and the desires for other things. And then the soil that is the good soil they hear the word and it begins to bear fruit. So Jesus tells the parable of the sower, but he doesn't give the explanation. He gives the parable of the sower and the disciples come to Jesus and say, why are you always talking to these people in parables? They're not very bright. You need to just tell them, right? Because they don't get it. 
And Jesus explaining to the disciples why he speaks in parables says this, Matthew 13, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. And this is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, You will indeed hear, but never understand. You will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull. With their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are you, for your eyes they see, and your ears they hear. So the parable of the sower, it is not God's intention that people not hear and believe. In fact, he wants them to hear and believe. In fact, he says to the disciples, blessed are you because you hear and you believe. He's just talking about these people are hardening their heart and resisting it. And when they hear the message of the kingdom, when they hear the word of God, they have hardened their heart and they do not respond. Second time that Jesus uses this is in John chapter 12. In John chapter 12, Jesus has been doing all of these miracles. And it says that he departed and he hid himself. And it says, though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe. So he'd done all these miracles. And he, he's frustrated. Done all these miracles and still no one believes. And then he quotes Isaiah. He has blinded their eyes, hardened their heart, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and he spoke of him. Nevertheless, many, even of the authorities, believed in him. So also in John chapter 12, Jesus is frustrated. I've done all of these miracles, and all these signs, and they still don't believe. They're hardening their heart. There are some who believe, and I want there to be more who believe, and it grieves me that they don't believe, but they are hardening their heart, and they're not receiving the word. So what Jesus does is he takes the word of the Lord to Isaiah and says it's not just about the people of Isaiah's day, but it's also about the people of the day of Jesus. Anytime the word of the Lord is spoken, do we harden ourselves against the word of the Lord or do we believe? Now let's add to that Hebrews chapter 3. If you're in our D groups, you are reading through the book of Hebrews and you'll probably have read Hebrews 3 this week or read next week. Hebrews 3 takes the same message idea that God had said to Isaiah, the same message that Jesus quoted both in Matthew with the parable of the sower and in John chapter 12, and he brings it forward to Benbrook in the year 2021. And this is what the writer of Hebrews says. He says, take care, brothers. Now that word brothers is a Greek word that literally means brothers and sisters, but literally it's talking about those who are among the people of God. Brothers and sisters in Christ, among those who are within the church, take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil and unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day as long as it is called today that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Go back up to verse 12 if you would. Take care lest there be in you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. I know we get nervous when this whole idea of Scripture talks about falling away, about whether or not you can lose your salvation. I think John gives us the most insight in that. They went out from us, he said, because they never really were of us. If they had been of us, they wouldn't have gone out from us. And the fact that they went out from us just demonstrates they never were of us. They were religious. They thought they were part of us. We thought they were too, but it demonstrates when they fell away, they never really were of us. But he says, take care, lest that be true in you. 
And so what Hebrews does is it says that the word of the Lord that God gave to Isaiah to speak that the people didn't want to listen to, so they hardened their hearts. And the same word of the Lord that Jesus had that he spoke and people didn't want to listen to, so they hardened their heart. It is the same word that God speaks to us today, and sometimes we don't want to listen to it and we harden our heart. Which is why we began this entire time with that simple prayer, Lord, is there something you want to say to me? So we go back to that beginning. Did God say something to you? Which is why the scriptures say today, if you hear his voice, if you prayed that prayer and it said, God, is there something you want to say to me? And God says something to you and you hear his voice. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. The parable of the sower and and all of these Scriptures, I think, are very helpful for us to understand what does it mean to harden our hearts. Just four images we get from the parable of the sower and from these other texts as well. The, the first seed that fell upon the path, they hardened their heart by not understanding the Word of God. And sometimes that's what happens to us. God speaks to us. God prompts. But we don't really give it enough of our thought, of our energy, of our prayer, to really seek to understand. We don't think of finding a brother and sister in Christ that we respect and get some counsel and say, I think this is what God says to me. I'm trying to understand it. We don't pray over it for days and days and weeks at an end. We, we pray prayers in the middle of the sanctuary and say, God, is there something you want to say to me? And then we kind of get a voice, but then we just kind of move on and forget about it, ignore it. We don't really grab onto it and say, I want to understand this and I want to know this so that I can act. So sometimes we just, either by neglect or by ignorance or just laziness, we don't really understand it. And so we harden our heart to it. Another way we harden our heart is that second seed. You hear God say something to you, and initially you respond, that's great, Lord, I, I want to do that. But then you realize there's suffering and tribulation and persecution that takes place on account of the Word. In other words, God says something to us, and it sounds pretty cool, but then we begin to take steps on it and realize there's a price to be paid if I'm going to put that Word into action. And we start doing a little cost-benefit analysis and say, I, I don't think that I'm really willing to pay that price to do this. And so we harden our heart. We, we draw back and we begin to pretend as if we never heard God say that in the first place because we, didn't, we don't want to count the cost. A third way that we harden our heart is God begins to speak a word to us and we, we receive it initially with joy and we get out there and we realize that if, if I pursue that, then I can't also pursue the treasures of this world. And so I can't have both. Jesus said you can't you know, love God and love money at the same time. You can't have a divided heart. And you begin to realize I can't go after both of these. And I've got to choose. And I like the treasures of this world, so I'm just going to draw back away from this and just pretend like I never heard God say that, and I'll just, I'll just harden my heart. The fourth way that we can harden our heart, the, the quote in the writer of Hebrews, when he says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart, that comes out of Psalm 95. If you go back and read Psalm 95, the whole context of Psalm 95 is a, is a moment in the Exodus experience when they come out and they come to the place where there's no fresh water and they begin to grumble against the Lord. God had already done all of these miracles in the past, so he has provided for them and got them to a place and they come to their first real obstacle and instead of believing that God can provide, they begin to grumble. They begin to harden their hearts. So maybe it just simply, the word of the Lord comes to us, and we just don't believe that God will actually take care of us, provide for us. We can't trust Him. And so we, we harden our hearts. We shrink back. We begin to say, maybe God didn't say that, and we just... We harden our heart against that. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Take care lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. Sometimes the word of the Lord that comes to us is the word of the Lord for salvation. 
That moment where, just like you have the Isaiah moment in the temple where you see the Lord. It's that moment of salvation where you realize that you are a sinner separated from God by your sin and there's nothing that you can do about it. Woe is me for I am ruined. And God says this is a way for your sins to be atoned for. I have sent my son to die on the cross for your sins. And your response to that is to believe and to confess and to receive that free gift. And maybe that's happening for you even in this very moment. And there is a temptation to say, I can deal with that later. Got plenty of time in my future life. I can deal with that later. And you hear the scripture say, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Because when you harden and harden and harden and harden, there comes a day when you can no longer hear, even as the word is spoken. But sometimes the word of the Lord comes to us, and it's not about salvation, it's about obedience. It is about trusting Him. It is about that next step that God's calling us to do. So let me ask you this morning, when you prayed that prayer, God, is there something you want to say to me? Is it something that you'll give your heart and mind to try to understand? God, what does that mean? I want to grab hold of that. I want to pray over that. I want to seek you over that. Is it something that's going to cost you? Is there a price to be paid? And you're just going to have to deal with the fact of whether or not you're willing to pay that price. Is there treasures of this world that you're going to lose? Or is it a moment in your life where God's calling you to trust Him? You've come to the area where there's no fresh water. Can God provide for me? Can I trust Him? Will He fulfill His promise? Or do I shrink back? Today, if you hear the voice of the Lord, do not harden your heart. Take care, lest there be in any of you an evil and unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. In a moment, the band's going to come back and we're going to sing another song. It is our song of invitation. It is an invitation for you to respond to the word of the Lord that God has said to you earlier today. And to take an action step on that. And if that's because the word of the Lord towards you is salvation... And God is calling you to put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today. I will be down here. Blake will be down here. While everyone else is singing, just come down and say, Today God is calling me to salvation. Will you pray with me and and show me how to ask Jesus to be my Savior? And maybe the next step for you is baptism. And maybe the next step for you is to join this church. And maybe that you just need someone to pray with you. Blake and I will be glad to pray with you. We want to open up our altar for prayer. You may not need Blake or I, but you want a special place of prayer to say, God, I hear you saying this to me, and this is challenging me, and I want to put my faith in you, and you just need a place to pour your heart out before the Lord. We open our altar. You're welcome to come down here and pray as well. Uh, Would you join me in prayer?